I want to take a moment and set the text in context by understanding that we have just read to you out of the Gospel of St. John. The Gospel of St. John is not one of the synoptic Gospels as Matthew, Mark, and Luke is. It stands in a category all by itself. It is uniquely tabulated and formulated and has a different perspective for us. It reads almost like a series of short stories unveiling one right after the other without the bother of continuity from day to day. It just moves us along in a methodical method toward a conclusion that exemplifies Christ with a different perspective and a different clarity from any of the other writers. It stands in a class all by itself largely and completely because John himself is quite different. He, he introduces the book, not from the perspective of proving the authenticity of Jesus' right to be the Messiah from the perspective of the lineage he has on his mother's side and father's side, as Matthew, Mark, and Luke would do. But no, he traces it all the way back to the beginning and says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. He's going right back to the spirit of who Jesus is, and not the flesh of who Jesus is. He goes back to the Ruah, to the breath, to the God Himself, to the Creator of the universe. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him. He shows us the deity of Jesus Christ, and the Word was made flesh. John 1, 14, and dwelt among us, and we beheld the wonder, the wonder of his glory, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This is John. This is John, and in the process of him delivering this, 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 this liturgy, as it were, in the process of him establishing this, this document of authenticity, this deed, this divine deed of trust, in the process of him unveiling the substantive origin of who Jesus is from a heavenly perspective, in the middle of it, he mentions uh, his own journey. Now, you must understand that when John mentions John the Baptist, you've got John talking about John. And I want to start with John talking about John. He mentions John the Baptist, but he is not John the Baptist. This is John the Evangelist or Saint John. This is John the Apostle. He is one of the 12. He is not John the Baptist. This is John the one who laid his head on Jesus' breast. This is John the one who sat with Jesus. This is John the one that made up the inner circle with Jesus. This is John the one that was in the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus. This is John, the one that was at the, at, the, at the table at the Last Supper with Jesus, described in this book alone as the one whom Jesus loved. Neither Matthew, Mark, nor Luke describe him as the one whom Jesus loved, but John describes himself as the one whom Jesus loves. It's odd to me that he says that. He doesn't say the one who loves Jesus. He says, I am the one whom Jesus loves, as if he knows that he has a favor on his life. And perhaps that favor is exemplified in the fact that he has always been in the inner circle He's always been in the right place. He's always been in the great crowd. He's always been there on the Mount of Transfiguration. He's always been there in moments of power in the inner circle with Jesus Christ. At the Last Supper with his head upon his breast, after the resurrection, it is John that identifies Jesus on the shore. He knows Jesus. He knows Jesus as if he knows him in a way that none of the other disciples seem to be able to declare him or understand him to the degree that John knows Jesus. He is the one whom Jesus loved. We know that, that there must be some validity to how he describes himself because Jesus rebuked the other disciples and said, if I leave him here until I come, what is that to do with you? Jesus defended him. And we know that he had a favor on his life because John outlived all the rest of the apostles. We know that he had an anointing on his life because he is credited for writing at least two books, the one we're reading from and the book of Revelations. We know that he had the favor of God on his life because Jesus comes back and unveils the apocalypse called the book of Revelations to him and he pins it. He has an inside track on who Jesus is and what Jesus wants 
and how Jesus moves and how Jesus loves. It must be an amazing thing to describe yourself as the one whom Jesus loved. Can you admit, hello, I'm Bishop Jenks. I'm the one whom Jesus loved. And who are you? <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm the one whom Jesus loves. That's, that's, that's how I identify myself. That's how I understand myself. That's how I realize my relationship with him is that I am a recipient of his love. It's not about me loving him because that's flaky and sometimes and spasmodic and sometimes inconsistent, but I am a recipient of a constant beam of light of love that shines down on me even into the darkest hour of the night. You may not see it, but it yet glares upon me because the love of God is that consistent. It is not spasmodic. It is not erratic. It is not temporal. It is not sometimey. It is consistent. I am always the one whom Jesus loves. He outlives everybody. This is the last testimony of Jesus Christ in the earth. It's given at the pen of John, the apostle, one of the twelve. And he writes to us in a powerful and profound way, and we are able to hear insights about Jesus that we would not otherwise hear. He declares in his writings the I am's over and over again, declaring the I am's. There are seven times that he says, he describes him as the seven I am's in the Gospel of St. John. The Christology that he brings to us is amazing. It depicts Jesus as divine, as, as preexistent, and identifies him with the one God. And besides him, there is no other. He's in a category all by himself. He says to us over and over, I am, I am, I am, I am. It reminds me of what God told Moses, I am that I am. John knows him as the I am that Moses saw him as in the burning bush. He describes him as, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate of the sheep. He describes him understanding, I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. He clearly understands in seven powerful ways the I amness of God. That's who's writing to us today. That's who's talking to us today. That's who's ministering to us today, the one whom Jesus loved. Good God Almighty, the one. If he don't love anybody else, he loves me. I'm the one whom Jesus loved. The, the confidence that he has reminds me of a well-loved child. You know, when a child is well-loved and knows that they are well-loved, there is a confidence that they have that, that gives them the ability to walk into the room and fill the room because they are sure of themselves. When you are not sure of yourself, you are always measuring yourself by other people's standards. When you are not sure of yourself, you are uncertain of your accomplishments, and it's not, it's not, it's not your fault. We live in a world that constantly over and over again teaches us to compare ourselves with other people. The first runner up in the beauty pageant, the second runner up in the beauty pageant. We've watched it all our lives. The Olympic award winner he is, and the nominee is over and over again. We are taught to be competitive, and we live in a competitive environment of am I the GOAT? the greatest of all times, sets me apart from all the other people. Everybody's fighting to be better. We're constantly measured and timed and compared over and over again, trying to understand ourselves by ourselves, comparing ourselves with ourselves. In so doing, it is not wise. It's a terrible thing to compare yourself. It's not wise to compare yourself. It leads to frustration and inner turmoil when you compare yourself and a feeling of unworthiness. And when you do feel worthy, it only lasts for a short time because there's always somebody who comes along who has attributes that you don't have. 
And I want to talk to somebody today who has constantly been miserable and insecure and uncertain about who you are and you don't know your place and you don't know your status and you don't know your role and you're always shifting and you're always wavering and you're always uncertain, often envious, often jealous, often unsure because you don't know who you are. You don't know your role. You don't know your role. And you can't be happy within yourself until you know your role. Because if you don't know your role, you're only good till somebody better comes along. And when somebody better comes along, you're intimidated. When you're intimidated, you become aggravated. When you become aggravated, you frustrate your environment because you don't know your role. You don't know, well, I'm the one whom Jesus, you don't know where you fit, who you are, where you stand. And so the only way you can evaluate your worth and you've been miserable and you've been successfully miserable, successfully miserable, you've been successful and still miserable because every time you have an accomplishment, you see somebody who's got something else and you say, well, I don't have that. If I could only have that, if I could only have this acknowledgement, when are they going to recognize me? When are they going to? And you're frustrated on the inside because you don't know your own. John knew who he was. I am the one whom Jesus loved. Don't pay no attention to the other 12. I'm the one whom Jesus loved. And yes, there are three other guys in the inner circle, but I am the one whom Jesus loved. Peter, James, and John showed up everywhere, but John clearly knew who he was. He knew his role. I am the one whom Jesus loved. You don't see him comparing himself with Peter. Why am I not preaching? on the day of Pentecost. Why, why, why am I not doing it? Why am I not doing this? Why am I not walking on water? Why? No, he knows who he is. He's comfortable on the boat while Peter is walking on the water trying to prove something. John is laid back on the boat because he knows that pretty soon Jesus is going to get to him. He knows if I stay where I'm at, Jesus is going to come to me. Why? Because I am the one whom Jesus loved. And I don't have to perform for anybody. And I don't have to impress anybody. And I don't have to be spectacular because I know my role. And when you know your role, you're not afraid to be around other great people because you're not constantly tormented by their greatness. I want to talk to somebody this morning who is constantly tormented by the greatness of other people. Tormented by, frustrated, comparing yourself, measuring yourself. Am I enough? Do I have what you have? Mine didn't look like yours. They put more on your plate than they put on my plate. You hit a note I didn't hit. They call on you more than they do. Stop! You can never be proficient in the kingdom of God until you know your role. And the role God has given you is commensurate with the gifts he's placed inside of you. You don't want to be like a Eddie Murphy movie where you're playing four roles in the movie. You don't want to be like one of the Tyler Perry movies where you're playing in every role. You want to be confident to know who you are and where you stand. And I suspect that part of it comes from knowing that John starts out talking about who God is. And sometimes knowing who God is helps you to know who you are. Since God is the script writer and he gave you your lines, the only thing you have to do is know your role. In the beginning, what's the word? In the beginning, what's the script? In the beginning, what's the word? In the beginning, what's the script? In the beginning, what's the word? And the word was with God. And the word was God. All things were made by him. Everything lined up the way he planned for it to be directed. He gave me everything I needed to be who I am and nothing that I needed to be who you are. I am fully equipped and totally loaded to perform the function I was created to do, and I cannot compare myself with Peter or James or Bartholomew or anybody else. I'm in a class all by myself. I am, I am, I am like he is. I am the one who the I am loves. If you could bring yourself to think like that, the torment would be over. 